you can still be in the house with your kids and still be uh, not present, right? You can still be there physically with them, but that doesn't mean they want to communicate with you. That doesn't mean they want to actually go and hang out with you and spend time with you. That's just as much an issue as you not being there physically. Yo, what's going on, guys? Welcome to the From Boys to Men show brought to you by the Squire program. Um, and if you if this is your first time clicking on our, our page, you've never seen our videos before. That makes sense because this is our episode number one. And we'll get into more about what we're doing on the show shortly. Um, but first of all, guys, I want to give you all a shout out. I want to say thank you for everybody who has shared our shorts up to this point. Um, this is actually our first long form episode on YouTube, but we've been uploading YouTube shorts since about April. Uh, yeah, we started our YouTube page in April, uh, and at, in the month of April, we only had seven subscribers, which is crazy. And now when we film this episode anyways, it's about 180,000 subscribers just from YouTube Shorts, which is actually absolutely insane. I've never heard of that before. And then obviously when we chop the video up and upload it on YouTube um, for you guys to see, it'll likely be more subscribers than that. So I want to say thank you so much for sharing these these uh, these shorts, um, sharing our message. Uh, it's something that we're extremely passionate about and we just really care about helping usher in the next generation of strong men after us. Um, and so we appreciate you guys sharing our message. So anyways, because of what we do here at the Squire program, we felt that this was going to be the most important episode, right? Because it's episode number one, obviously. But we got to talk about this issue that this this kind of this this issue, this cancer that plagues the entire nation, right? Really the entire world. But if I'm being honest, you know, I know uh, us Americans love winning. We like being the best. We like to consider ourselves the, the, the best country ever. But this is one statistic that we don't want to be leading in. And we absolutely are crushing, like spanking everybody around the world. And that is the crisis of fatherless homes, right? The percentage is through the roof. I think the global average is 7% of homes uh, don't have fathers in them. America alone it's 23%, which is crazy, like tripling the global average. I think the lowest is China for that 3%, um, so which is obviously much better. And so this is the one statistic that we do not want to be crushing everybody in, but we're just, we're, we're destroying them and that needs to change. And so we got to talk about this. Just a couple quick stats for you. 85% um, of youth that are currently in prison grew up in fatherless homes. 63% of youth suicides involve a child who was living in a fatherless home when they made their final decision. 85% of all children which exhibit some type of behavioral disorder uh, come from a fatherless home. And I know this story and these statistics very well because my story is, is exactly that. I didn't grow up with my dad in the home. Um, my dad is, a, is an awesome man. We have a great relationship now, um, but it didn't start off that way. You know, my, my dad um, uh, you know, has a lot of awesome qualities. I got a lot of great qualities from him. He's charismatic. He's got the gift of gab. He was a ladies man. You know, he's obviously got that flavor, that style, um, clothing, you know, he, he was a, a fashion designer. And so he has a lot of awesome qualities and traits about him. Um, but by today's standard, he's a street dude, right? Selling things that can get you locked up, you know, robberies, uh, you know, you name it, just doing things that, you know, fast money, but office, obviously fast problems come along with that. And, there was kind of a, a system, a pattern, right? Much like most people do when they get in these kind of situations, there's a pattern of in and out of the system where you actually, you don't really get out of the system, but in and out of jail. Right. And there was uh, there came a time where my mom and dad had uh, one of those conversations that, you know, talking about, they want to have kids, right. They may be talking about how many kids they want to have. Would they like to have a boy or a girl, right. They're having this conversation. And my dad immediately was like, I want a boy. I need my boy. I got to have my boy first, right. The other two, cause they want a three, uh, if their plan went accordingly. Um, if uh, all goes as planned, I want my boy to be first, right. I got to have him be the oldest. And then after that, doesn't matter if it's boy or girl, whatever, but I need my boy. I want a son so bad. Right. And so he wanted a boy so bad, which was awesome. But he had to you know, kind of at a crossroads where it's like, okay, I got to make some better decisions. I don't want to be in and out of, of jail. Obviously, I want to be here. And uh, not in a way where it was like a, a sacrifice where he didn't want to, you know, a sacrifice that he was kind of forced to make. But it was like, no, I, this is what I want to do. I want to start a family. I want to be um, here and, and present. And, uh, and, and that's, that's just it, right? Easy, said and done. Now, there came a point where after my dad made that decision, right? Uh, he got a normal nine to five job. He was, he went from making $3,000 a day to like $1,200 a month, right? Which was obviously like that flipped his whole world upside down. He's not used to this kind of financial situation. My mom, on the other hand, uh, is a registered nurse. 
So she's making great money, right? And you know how this, this, you know, maybe you have the situation like this in your own home where, you know, you, you maybe fall into hard times or maybe you don't fall into hard times. It's just kind of where the, the wife is making more than the husband. I don't see anything wrong with that per se. Um, but there are some things that I think will kind of create some issues, some underlying issues. And this is what my parents ran into, right? So one conversation turned into more of an argument between them two. And uh, it was something as simple as running up the phone bill. My dad was on the phone talking to somebody. My mom, you know, approaches him and says, hey, you know, this this phone bill is crazy. This is crazy. Like you can't be spending, you know, you can't be on the phone like that. Like this is you're running up the bill like you can't. No, like we don't have it like that. And my dad obviously, you know, took it as an insult. He's like, well, we can have it like that. Like we could we could I could make some. Listen, we could. All right, cool. Yeah, we, we can have it like that. Right. You know, probably a smart remark. My mom uh, uh, said some things. He said some things, you know, escalated. And uh, that resulted in him, you know, calling a friend and, you know, one of his street dudes and say, hey, we're going on this mission. Let's go get some money. Right. So they go on this mission and uh, it was a home invasion for you guys probably, you know, trying to figure out well, what was it? Was he selling something? Was he doing it was a home invasion robbery. Right. And uh, it was him and eight other guys who were going on this mission. Right. My dad, of course, being one of them. Now, out of the eight people that went on this mission, three of them got caught, my dad being one of them, and then five of them got away. So my dad got caught and, uh, and he was sentenced 30 years. Now, luckily he didn't have to serve all of that, but I mean, basically, if you ask him, it might as well have been 30 years. It was 24, 20, 23 and a half years um, that he spent locked away and, uh, and, and away from his family, right? Because at this time I was on the way Actually, no, I'm sorry. I was not on the way. It was already, I was eight months old when he had gotten incarcerated. Um, and so, uh, so it was, it was crazy, right? I was super little. And the, the, the crazy part about it is obviously if he could turn back the hands of time and re, you know, remake that decision, like he obviously wouldn't go on that mission. And so I was eight months old when this happened, right? He went on this mission and, uh, and of course me being so little, I didn't know what was going on, but until I got a little bit older, I started asking questions about where's dad and it changed from, you know, he's on a work trip to on vacation or whatever to just having to tell me the truth. Right. And so I grew up really frustrated. I grew up really frustrated, not having him in my life for a number of reasons, obviously like, you know, number one, I mean, just not having that, that male mentorship there, that, that leader, that, you know, that, that person that I can look up to as far as a man, right. I love my mom. She did an incredible job, but um, I needed that, that, that male role model, right? And I needed to be my dad, not just a, you know, like an older brother or someone that I, you know, maybe a family friend or something like that, but like my dad, I needed my dad there. And I didn't have that. And I was really frustrated and I was yearning for that, that male leadership. Now, fast forward just a little bit. When I was 10 years old, it was 2005. And, uh, my mom was always in fitness, right? She was a fitness addict and she took really good care of herself. And she used to go to this park down the street from our house. Butterfield Ranch Park and she would um, train it was like a class of like uh, four or five or maybe six other ladies and they would work out together at the park and the trainer the coach uh, was a six foot tall Armenian man named Bedros Koulian that was the first time I met Bedros and uh, at the time I didn't know that this guy was going to completely change my life but um, now looking back in retrospect that was that day was was uh, you know such a historical day in my life because of all the things he's done for me but we'll get into that in a second so that's the first time I met Bedros right and, uh, you know, time goes on. Uh, my mom, I think either went to work out another gym or with a different trainer or whatever happened. And so we lost, con well, I lost connection with him because there was really no reason for me, a 10 year old to keep in touch with him. And so, um, you know, back onto the, the life of not having a, a male mentor right now, a lot more mistakes were made than necessary. I believe because of that, because of the fact that I didn't have that, uh, that, that, that male, that masculine um, role model in my life, that masculine figure in my life. I think that I was a little bit more aggressive than I, than I should have been. Um, you know, a little bit more, I'd have these outbursts of just rage and I was just mad. Right. And now when I'm older, I understand where that was coming from. But at the time I was just like, it was kind of this woe with me, you know, why is my dad not here? Why does, why does everybody else have their dad? At least it seemed like they had their dad and I didn't, I thought, I thought I was the only one. Um, but I mean, obviously now I know in the stats that obviously is not the case. And so anyways, Fast forward again, I meet Bedros again. And the reason being is because my mom, um, I was, I was just, I just got married. My mom knew that I was into entrepreneurship and that I wanted to start up my own business. 
and she says, uh, well, let me reach out to Bedros. I hear he's doing pretty well for himself now. Um, you know, just crazy. Now we come back like, dude, pretty well for yourself. Dude, this freaking, he's crushing it. And, uh, and so anyways, she says, Hey, let me reach out to him. Let me see if he's willing to uh, have a meeting with you in the, in his, in his, in his, you know, conference room or something. If you can go to his office or visit him and just ask him questions about business. I said, thank you so much. So she reaches out to B and, uh, and he says, of course, yeah, of course. I remember late and have him come down. Like, dude, that'd be awesome. I'd love to catch up with him. What's he up to these days? So I come to his headquarters, actually here where we're filming this, this, uh, this episode, and I'm blown away with all the stuff that he has. Like he has the elevator where it has his, his initials on it, the BK on it. You know, this is his whole building. He has a, a media team. He has people upstairs. Like it's a full house and everyone gets along. Like the, the, the company culture is awesome. And I'm like, man, this is super cool. And so uh, he basically from that point on took me under his wing and taught me as if I was his own. Like if I was his son and I looked at him as a father figure and I'll forever be grateful for 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 him and I literally have an endless amount of appreciation for him for everything he's done for me and this goes to show the importance of male mentorship um and and having that especially you know in a young boy's life now um i also think this is really cool too i gotta add this in guys because this is a, a big deal for me so i'm a father myself i have two girls my my oldest is three and a half my youngest has just turned one and uh, so i only have girls up to this point but now i have my son on the way as well he's coming in late november and so I'm super, super excited. So now this is a complete, you know, everything just comes around full circle because um, I grew up, you know, not having my dad, but now my dad, he came home uh, two, maybe three years ago, actually, yeah, three years ago in 2020, right before the pandemic. And so now I have a beautiful relationship with him. We're best friends. Um, I also have a relationship with with Bezos, who I consider my 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 rich dad, right? And in, in the way of, you know, if you've read the book, Robert Kiyosaki, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, he's I look at him as like, as like my rich dad. He teaches me all about, you know, all kinds of different things. But anyways, that's our relationship. And so I have two dads now. Right. And then now I'm not only going to be a father of girls, but I'm also going to be father of a boy. Right. I have my son coming. And so I'm super, super excited. And so, again, uh, another reason why the Squire program is so important, because I have experienced firsthand what it feels like to not have that masculine role model, that leader, that mentor in your life, especially being a boy, it's important in both boy and girl's life, um, but especially a boy, we need someone to emulate. We need someone to look up to and aspire to be more like as a man. We don't know how to be a man unless we see an example, right? And sometimes we don't get the best example, but I was very lucky to be able to meet Bedros um, and be a part of a program like this. And so, um, so it's, it's awesome. Super, super excited about that. Now, what you guys got to think about is this, you might be watching this and might be thinking, Hey, well, all right, well, what do I do? Right? Well, maybe this is your situation. Maybe the, maybe you're not incarcerated or maybe you, you're not, you're not, uh, you're, you're there in the house with your son or your kids, but don't let that, you know, uh, basically just think that you're, you're, you, you can't make that same mistake. You can still be in the house with your kids and still be, uh, not present, right? You can still be there physically with them, but that doesn't mean they want to communicate with you. That doesn't mean they want to actually go and hang out with you and spend time with you. That's just as much an issue as you not being there physically. And so make sure that you're doing everything that you can to, you know, uh, be there and support your kids and build a, an actual relationship with them, not just a superficial one where it's just, hey, I'm the father. I tell you what to do. Uh, you listen and that's it. There's there's really no relationship there besides the fact that basically you're a dictator at that point. Um, this is affecting your kids more than you realize, you know, and I and I used to think in the past why would did this happen to me? Why did I have to grow up in the household with with without my dad? And I realize now with the opportunity to be able to speak to you guys that because of my story, now I can share with you guys a little bit about how this is really affecting your kids and how we can basically or hopefully try and, uh, uh, you know, shrink in this statistic or this number of 23 percent of fatherless homes in America. This is this is a big deal, guys, because you got to think about it. It's affecting your kids in multiple different ways. Um, they become more aggressive lower self-esteem, they're confused, they're frustrated, and you, are being the dad, need to step up and talk to them, communicate, let them know that you're there, right? Not just physically, but emotionally, mentally, be there for their games, wrestle with them, you know, be a dad. Like this is, this should be like, I mean, you guys should be able to just, you should be doing that already, but if you're not, it's never too late, man. You guys gotta, you gotta sharpen up, man, and this is what it's all about. So I wanna offer solutions for you guys, right? Because the story I shared with you about my dad right now, obviously we have a great relationship, great relationship. 
Um, but obviously for a long time, we did not. And what I would offer you is to number one is to not dabble, right? If you remember in the beginning, my dad was, you know, like I said, in and out of the streets doing his thing. And, uh, but he didn't cut his vice clean, like the vice of living that street life. He had to cut that vice completely clean. You guys have vices. I have vices. Everyone has vices. You got to cut your vice clean if you're trying to really become the best version of yourself, become the best father, become the best leader. Because if you don't cut your vices clean, I'm telling you, man, you're subject to falling over and over and over again. You got to cut it clean. People are addicted to food, you know, pornography, alcohol, uh, gambling, um, you know, uh, the streets, women, whatever it is, like you got to cut your vice clean, man, get, remove yourself completely. And, and basically, um, just, just get it away from you. Don't, don't tempt yourself. Don't, don't fool yourself into thinking you're strong enough to, to just being like, ah, oh, it's not a big deal. I can just stop, remove yourself from the situation. You got to make a big change if you really want to be there for your kids. Um, and so anyways, guys, like this, this episode, actually not even just this episode, this whole show means so much to me because of, uh, this conversation that we're going to be having over the next however long this show goes, right? Uh, the conversation of becoming better men, better fathers, better husbands, um, and, and really just a better generation to come. So anyways, guys, if you uh, appreciated this message, if you got some value from it, do me a favor, please continue to share because you guys have done an awesome sh uh, job of sharing, liking, commenting, and engaging with it. But continue to share. Um, share this video with somebody. Let them know that we have an actual show now. We're not just uh, uploading shorts. We're going to have a weekly show uploaded. And so do us a favor. We'd appreciate it if you guys share, like, um, and comment below your story. I want to know a little bit more about you guys and who's actually watching the show. So anyways, we appreciate you guys. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.